Awesome. Well, uh, thank you to uh, to Greg and Molly for uh, for having me, and to the Cloud Foundry Foundation for the opportunity, uh, and Nithya as well. Nithya Ruff, who, if you were at the keynotes yesterday, um, uh, was <clears throat> also teed this talk up as well. Uh, my name is Chris Power. Uh, I've been at Comcast about uh, about four years. Um, I work on the uh, the cloud team. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I want to just spend a little time today to talk about open source. Uh, in the in the cloud era, if you will, uh, and give you a bit of perspective uh, from from where I sit on the cloud side of things, uh, in terms of how we sort of see open source and how we see teams consuming open source. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the challenges that I think we're seeing in uh, in the open source space today, um, and and how that's reflected in the cloud. Um, so as I said, uh, my name is Chris Power. I'm a cloud architect at uh, at Comcast. I lead what we call the Cloud Center of Excellence, uh, where we partner with a number of teams across the organization, uh, not just Greg's, but, um, but our security organization, data center, engineering, and networking, uh, and a number of other SRE and tooling teams as well, uh, to try to be an enabling function for the organization as they transform from you know, this predominantly data center-centric uh, environment into a very cloud-focused environment. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the cloud stuff that we've, we've done, but I think we'll largely stay focused on some of the open, open source bits. Um, yeah, so that, that's uh, sort of what I do today. Historically at Comcast, I've built solutions in our OpenStack environments and our, and our AWS environments as well. So I guess about eight or nine years ago, uh, there was a, somebody made the statement, I think it was um, Mark Andreessen, that software is eating the world, uh, and, and it had probably had been for some time. Um, but I think more recently, uh, some folks have come out and said, open source is eating software, uh, which I think is largely the case, right? If you take a look at the historical software models, they were largely built around closed source proprietary solutions. Uh, and with the advent of open source 20, 30, even 40 years ago, uh, you've seen that cannibalize that market space where developers, groups of developers, commercial uh, software providers as well have gotten on this bandwagon where they've built open source that essentially at least rival, if not rivals in some places displaces, in some cases displaces some of their commercial solutions. But I, I think what we're seeing today is the, the possibility that is, is cloud now eating open source. Uh, and I think if you're, if you're familiar with the space and you use any of the, the sort of public cloud vendors that are out there today, you'll see that what, what I think is happening is there's a strong demand to consume, deploy, and run open source by enterprises, middle, sort of middle market companies, and even, and of course, startups as well. Um, but a lot of the times, that's not necessarily their core business, right? They're focused on building products and features, and this is true for us at Comcast in a lot of cases. Uh, and so what they want is to be able to potentially consume those open source products in some way. So those projects make, the, make their way into, into the cloud market space. Uh, and we see these cloud vendors um, running open source software uh, because there's a, a demand in the marketplace for, us, for it. And it's, it's causing, I think, some interesting challenges that we'll talk a little bit about. Um, give you a sense of the, of the public cloud market space. Uh, it's growing as, as I think is no surprise to anyone. AWS obviously dominates this space with somewhere between 31 and 34%, depending on who you talk to. This, I think, was from Canalis. Um, and then Azure is growing incredibly rapidly in GCP as well now as they've brought on some, some folks over from Oracle to run the, the cloud business there. Um, what I think you see there on the right is, is actually endemic of the industry, but also true at Comcast as well. 84% of enterprises have a multi-cloud strategy. So either some form of multiple public clouds or multiple private clouds. Uh, we have both. Um, and I think it's 58% are actually consuming hybrid cloud in some way, meaning they run something on premise and they're running something in the cloud. Uh, so a lot of these open source solutions are really good to do both of those things. But in some cases, people that are moving to the public cloud are looking to consume these services, as I said, as, as services, not as, de not as deployments of those things. Um, and I think the, the market's just gonna, gonna continue to grow. Gartner's looking at uh, almost 18, 17% uh, growth in, in 2019 uh, across the worldwide public cloud services footprint. So I think this is gonna continue to just uh, expand and we see that playing out at Comcast as well. Um, but open source is critical to the way these cloud vendors behave and perform. If it wasn't for open source, I don't think very many of them would exist in the way they do today. Um, it started with Linux, 
right? The, tip, the, the Red Hats and the Canonicals of the world and other distributions. But it includes things like Zen and KVM as the hypervisors for all of the virtual machines that you'll find out there running on these various cloud uh, providers' solutions. But if you look further, you'll find open source strewn throughout the various things, uh, various services that they offer. So Elasticsearch, uh, Hadoop, um, MySQL, Postgres, uh, things like Kafka, TensorFlow, Kubernetes, you name it, it's probably being offered as a service in one form or another on one of these clouds. And all of these cloud vendors have very different approaches to the way that they're partnering with uh, or, apply, or bringing open source to market. Um, so you, if you look at Google, they've taken what most consider to be a sort of open source first uh, approach by trying to put Kubernetes out in the market and things like that. You look at Microsoft, they've become one of the biggest open source contributors uh, out there and with the uh, acquisition of GitHub certainly are firmly entrenched in that space. And then you look at Amazon who delivers a majority of these open source uh, products as services and recently in the last couple of years has also become a big open source contributor, uh, arguably maybe forcibly so, uh, but certainly have, have turned and started to play in that, that market as well. Uh, what this is doing of course uh, is creating some interesting challenges in the space for open source, especially for what people traditionally refer to as these commercially uh, commercial open source software models uh, where you've got uh, an open source project that's being delivered commercially um, and there's some interesting business uh, pieces at play there. Um, clearly though, the open source space is attracting a ton of investment. Um, just from 2010 to 2015, eight and a half times growth, uh, you see a tremendous amount of investment in the CNCF ecosystem, so think Kubernetes, uh, think Pr Prometheus, Istio, Envoy, et cetera. Blockchain obviously is, is a, a huge investment space. Um, front end Node.js is one, and, and some of the stuff that, that you'll find over on the networking side as well. So clearly there's a lot of money pouring into open source, um, both from a venture capital perspective, but also from an investment on the, on the cloud provider side. Uh, and this is further reflected just last year alone. Um, this was, I think, through the middle to end of 20, about the fall time frame of 2018, $65 billion pouring into uh, into there versus uh, in M&A uh, IPOs and acquisitions. It started with Red Hat acquiring CoreOS in January um, and moved all the way through the end of the year uh, with Elastic having what I think was about a $5 billion IPO. Uh, in the middle there, you've got Pivotal obviously IPO'd. You've got Salesforce's acquisition of MuleSoft, one of the bigger ones that we've seen. Uh, Microsoft's acquisition, as we said, of GitHub. What I think, though, you're seeing here is that um, there's clearly a tremendous amount of value in these open source products, both from a commercial perspective, but also from a consumption perspective. I, I think at Comcast, if I were to survey the footprint, uh, we probably would find 95 to 99% of the technologies listed here in use in some way, shape, or form, many of which we're commercially engaged with, but at the very least, more than likely not, you'll find it in some open source form as well. Um, we run our own internal GitHub Enterprise, for example, um, have had great success with that, uh, as well as some of the other things here. Um, but what we've also seen are lots of huge acquisitions and consolidations. So if you think about the, the big data space, uh, we saw Cloudera and Hortonworks merge this year effectively. Uh, they had slightly different open source models. Hortonworks was sort of more open, open source, whereas Cloudera was partially closed. Uh, but they were both built on top of the Hadoop ecosystem. You saw the same thing um, with, uh, in the Kubernetes space, right? VMware acquiring Heptio, for example. Um, but the three biggest acquisitions totaling some fifth, almost $50 billion this year were obviously the Salesforce, MuleSoft, Microsoft, GitHub, and more recently Red Hat acquiring IBM. And I think um, that makes 2018 the biggest year in open source uh, in terms of acquisition. Uh, in the last 20 years, if, if I were to say this. So I think three of the top 10 software acquisitions uh, in the, for 2018, in the past 10 years, were, uh, were open source and occurred in 2018. Um, so clearly a lot, of, a lot of space here and a lot of integrations uh, and a developer efficiency that have been born out of this. It's interesting to see where some of these will go. Um, I think the Microsoft acquiring GitHub one is, is certainly caused some consternation in the, in the industry. I, I personally think it will end up being a good thing, but I think time will tell. Um, and the same thing probably for Red Hat as well.
Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of the current business models and what we see, and some of the newer ones that we see here. I, 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 this is not an exhaustive list. I sort of, in researching some of the stuff for this talk, came across lots of different top five business model lists and things like that. But I think this sums up a majority of them. You've got the, the subsidy angle, so corporate subsidies, um, personal subsidies, meaning you're an open source developer, you're writing code on your own and contributing that. Uh, we have corporations that, of course, pay people to build open source. We do that as well. You've got donations-based models, corporate patronage, grants, um, and then the more traditional models, right? So support and services, the Red Hat model, if you will. Um, distributions like um, you know, Red Hat and, uh, and you know, Pivotal and things like that. And then the hosted or software as a service models that we've been talking about, uh, where someone will take open source and, and then run that and make that available, or they'll have a closed source model and make that available as well. An example of that might be something like uh, Databricks, for example, um, which is a Spark-based vendor. Uh, and then the, the licensing models, which is where things, I think, get fairly complicated. So you've got open core, you've got the enterprise features that get layered in on top of that. And Confluent is a really good example of, of one of those, um, what would traditionally be known as a commercial open source uh, software vendor. Uh, there's a good list out there if you Google around for, um, I think the top 100 uh, open source, commercially, commercial open source vendors by the uh, open source software capital or group. They, they keep a, a public uh, Google doc. Uh, of that, which was really interesting to take a look at. But what we're seeing is, is some new business models come into this space here. Um, and what I think is really interesting is that you see this reflected in other industries as well. So Tidelift is an, is an example of one of these. It's a subscription-based model where you pay a subscription and your uh, subscription goes to fund the creators of the, of the software. Um, and, and, and where else have we seen this, right? So if you think about the social media space, think about YouTube, you've got maybe 100 channels that have a million or more followers out there, and those folks have this tremendous amount of inertia behind them, and they're doing great for the most part. And then you've got this huge long tail of channels with very small following, but people are grinding it out there every day to build content, some pretty amazing content. And the same is true for open source, right? So what, have, what has the social media space turned to? Things like Patreon subscription-based. Hey, you pay, you get extra content, access to um, content ahead of time, uh, ability to meet the creators, things like that. And I think we're seeing solutions like Tidelift and other things that are sort of do either donation or subscription-based uh, mirroring that same thing here, which is this um, crowd-funded uh, creation-based economy uh, really driving the limits of what we think of as business models. Um, so I wanted to focus just for a minute on the, on the open core model because um, that's, I think, really the foundation for a lot of what we're seeing today. So just maybe explain what, what, what it is. Um, and, and this was sort of uh, new to me and as a definition, but I think it's, it's probably familiar if you've, if you've looked at the space at all, right? So pulled this from Wikipedia, um, but it's, it's a business model that, that helps support the monetization of commercially produced software. So typically there's a core open source project somewhere and then packaged around that is some number of layers of either open or source available code or closed source proprietary uh, third party code, right? And, or some mix of that with some licensing in the mix and it gets fairly complicated and we'll talk about a couple of examples. But generally speaking, um, this is, is the core definition of it and most commercial open source software companies are using some form of this model today. And, and I think most have been largely successful, right? We, we just went through the 65 billion odd dollars of money that's flowed into that space in the last sort of 12 months. And many of those are traditional commercial open source software companies. Uh, but, what, but what we're seeing is that um, as the cloud vendors come into the space and start delivering these solutions as services, they're challenging the business models of these commercial open source companies uh, directly. Um, so, what we're then seeing is we're seeing new licenses come into play. Uh, licenses that are shocking some, complicating other, uh, the, the space, I think. Um, the first foray in this space was Commons Clause, which was intended to take open source and make it essentially um, protective against the cloud vendors from deploying their software as services uh, in a commercial sense to try to create space for these commercial vendors who support the open source projects, mostly directly, right, to to, to be able to make some money, because at the end of the day, open source is, is not free. Somebody is paying for it somehow, either through time or money. Some notable examples in 2018 were Mongo, DB, Redis, Elastic, uh, Confluent, as we mentioned. Uh, what we saw was we saw reactions from these companies to the open source vendors either 
historically running services like Elasticsearch, for example, or more recently, Kafka, for example, as a service, uh, and reactions to that in the form of th these vendors going and changing their commercial licenses to expressly prohibit, in most cases, the, um, the, the, the offering of, their, of these open source projects as services via the, the cloud. Um, and, and they're doing this in a, in a protective sense. Whether this is going to, to sort of work or not is a good question. I think this presents a lot of challenges for the space. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of pushback from the open source community as they've introduced these new licenses, understandably, because generally speaking, they're not open source. Open source is not just, here's the code. Open source is, here's the code, and here's rules around how you can distribute the code, and that's where these licenses really change the game. Um, they add complexity. They make it complicated for enterprises like Comcast to figure out how to go about packaging that software and delivering it. In most cases, these licenses are not targeting uh, you and I in, in that form. But um, the question then is, do they actually solve the problem? Because some, Common Clause has been in effect for a while and other sort of AGPL and other types of licenses have been in effect for a long time. And these vendors are still out there doing this, these cloud vendors. Um, but they're reacting to, to, a, to market demand, right? The, the vendors see a demand in the market and they run this, these open source projects as a result of that. Uh, so the question then are, is, are they enforceable? Uh, and I think we've yet to, we've yet to really see that. Um, and then it makes it m typically harder, I think, to combine these models, these open source hybrid models, with other open source projects, because then you get in these overlapping license situations, which I think for, especially for large organizations like ourselves, um, complicates things quite, quite a bit. Um, so I'm going to talk about, I, I think, a couple of specific examples just to really look at this in a concrete fashion, because this was helpful for me to really understand this. Um, so Confluent and Elastic, we'll just maybe touch on those. Um, from a commercial perspective, uh, Confluent offers a, uh, you know, is built around, is an open core project, right? It's built around an open source distribution, um, Apache Kafka, licensed under Apache 2.0. Uh, they offer it as a platform you can download in the upper right there, as well as via Confluent Cloud, which is essentially a managed service that they provide, which still happens to run on most of the public cloud vendor solutions. Um, but what we saw recently, I think towards the end of last year, was the release of managed Kafka in Amazon, as an example, uh, and, and Confluent reacting to that with the introduction of the Confluent Community License, which is this tweener license that sits in between traditional open source Apache 2.0, Kafka, and the Confluent Enterprise License, which provides some enterprise-grade features, which is a commonly sort of accepted model. Um, you know, it's one that, that Pivotal uses. It's one that you know, other distributions use. Uh, with the injection of this in between, that covers some of their, uh, I'm going to call them value-added proprietary features, uh, things like their KSQL, um, the schema registry, which is super important in stream data platforms. Um, and essentially, all this license does is expressly prohibit the use of, the, um, of these features for, uh, by cloud vendors when offering a managed streaming platform, right? So they are very much, this is very much targeted at that specific um, attack vector, if you will. Um, but it certainly complicates things. Some of these vendors actually provide this middle tier of source code as source available as part of their distributions, and others do not. Uh, so a lot of the times when you pull this down, you may get both the piece on the left and the piece in the middle or not, and some of that stuff. Um, and that makes it, I think, complicated for us when we're trying to figure out how do we consume this and how do we legally uh, deploy these, this software uh, within our organizations. Um, and the, honestly, the same can be largely said of Elasticsearch. Um, they finally decided that they would take their X pack, which was their sort of proprietary feature around uh, that they de delivered on top of the Elastic Core, uh, and actually roll that into their open source distribution as code available features that are free, generally speaking, outside of their specific enterprise features. Uh, and so they have a similar model. Their code is actually open code available in there, uh, so it does make it a bit complicated. Um, and then what we saw as a direct result of, of sort of some of these things was, was we saw Amazon then saying, okay, well, you know, we're going to release what we call open distro for Elasticsearch, which is essentially a fork of the Elasticsearch um, code base that they then partnered with, I believe, Expedia and Netflix to start distributing, which essentially offers under Apache 2.0 license all of the features 
that are covered by, the, by that tweener elastic license that, that essentially says you can't use these features as a cloud vendor to deploy these things. Um, that stuff has been developed, majority of it at least, and then pushed out through Apache 2.0 via the, uh, the open distro for Elasticsearch. So we've clearly got a, a clashing of, of business models and licensing here that I think um, this was just uh, March 11th, so we're talking less than a few weeks ago, right? So this is really early stage. Not sure where this is going to play out, but I think it's really interesting to see these two things. And it's unfortunate in some respects because now we've got essentially forked repositories. And this is what I think is, is the challenge with some of these hybrid license models. So what can we do? Um, I think Abby said it yesterday, engage more in open source. Engage in the community, right? Code, bug fixes, documentation, feedback, issues, um, community engagement in the form of all of us sitting here today, supporting our foundations, um, meetups, going to conferences, um, and financial support, right, as supporters of foundations or as um, organizations that are paying developers to build code. There's a myriad ways that we can, as a community, can, can help move this forward. It won't necessarily solve this murky hybrid license problem, but the more that we're engaged and understand and are, are intelligent consumers of open source, the more we can be involved in the debate uh, and work with the cloud vendors and work with the open source distributions and work with the commercial open source solutions to really per, to get to a, some sort of tenable situation. Because ultimately what we're trying to foster here is a sustainable um, technology space where people can make money off of software um, and businesses can run and build amazing products. Um, and, and, and today, that's a, lot, a lot of that is based on open source. Um, so just to talk a little bit about what we're doing at Comcast for a few minutes, um, I don't think we have the answers or all of the solutions. Um, and we certainly could be doing more. Uh, but I think we are doing a lot, as Nithya mentioned yesterday at the keynotes, um, and just wanted to cover that a little bit. So for the benefit of the folks in the room, um, Comcast is uh, a, mere, a bunch of different brands. So Xfinity is one that folks are well known. So that's TV, internet, uh, home security, mobile now, and voice, traditional landline. And uh, we are also own NBC and Universal Studios. So brands like CNBC, NBC, all of those, uh, film and television networks, Telemundo, uh, Fandango, I believe, as well, um, and the Universal Studios, uh, studios as well as the theme parks. Uh, and as of, I guess it was maybe six months ago, um, we also, Sky is also part of our uh, corporate umbrella, if you will. So that would be the equivalent of Comcast and the cable pieces in, in the UK as well. Um, so what you'll find though, is you'll find the use of cloud as well as the use of open source throughout all of these brands. As, as is probably no surprise. So let's talk just a quick uh, minute about our open source journey because I think um, it, is, it is sort of emblematic of, of our commitment to, to this space. Um, go all the way back to 2006, we started consuming open source, which is I think where most people start, um, and that's natural. Uh, at some point a few years later, we decided to start contributing, and they, the tr contributions came out slowly, uh, little bits here and there where we were using things. Uh, we got involved with the Apache Software Foundation in 2011. Uh, and we started launching open source projects on the public github.com under the Comcast organization in 2012. Uh, so if you go there today, and we'll talk a little bit about that, you'll find quite a few projects. Um, we've been supporters of other various foundations that we'll talk about. I, I think really the, the, the sort of watershed moment for the organization has really come in the last two or three years with the uh, with the advent of our open source practice office, um, who I see Nithya is the head of, is sitting in the audience here today, uh, as well as an amazing team of people, a number of which I see also in the room, um, who really are a center of excellence and a knowledge base that we as a, as a large engineering organization can go and speak to and understand what are the right open source licenses and practices that we should be looking at. Uh, and they work with various parts of the organization and foundations and, and our legal group to really enable us as an engineering organization to build products and be really thoughtful about how we do that with respect to open source. Um, and then I think, uh, you know, most recently we've gotten involved in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. We've been involved in the Cloud Foundry uh, Foundation for as well. And OpenStack has also been an area where we've been uh, significant contributors in the past. 
Um, so specifically from a community engagement perspective, we're involved kind of across the board in lots of things. This is just some highlights. Um, I've personally been involved in the stuff on the left, uh, specifically OpenStack and Cloud Native Computing Foundation. You will find deployments of all of the software here within Comcast in various forms, as well as con contributions coming from Comcast, uh, Comcasters. Um, some of which are done as part of their normal course of business, some of which are done through our open source fellowship program where we're actually sponsoring people to spend time uh, contributing back. Um, in addition, we're strong supporters financially of these open source foundations, specifically um, a lot of the ones that you, that you see here. Um, I'm most familiar with, sort of with the ones on the left there, um, where we're engaged at kind of a number of different levels. Uh, so I think there's, a, there's a, a really strong commitment from, from our organization to try to be involved, to be out there, be talking to people, hearing challenges, and trying to deliver um, you know, our challenges and, and, and some of our needs back into this, these organizations. Um, if you're interested in seeing some of the projects, you can head over to comcast.github.io. Um, I just highlighted and picked a few of the, the most recent contributions that we've made. These are projects that we've open sourced ourselves um, and, and have gotten, I think, quite a bit of traction. The tr canonical example for us is Apache Traffic Control uh, down on the bottom left there, which is a traffic server for our content delivery network. Uh, and that's been something we've open sourced and has been open sourced for some number of years now. More recently, though, in the last 12 months, the uh, top three there. So Trickster, which is a um, open source project that plays in the CNCF space quite a bit. It's a front end cache for Prometheus. So if you've ever used Prometheus, which is a metrics solution, um, it can, it's generally a good performer, but where it starts to slow down sometimes is, is from, a, from a query perspective. Uh, and so Trickster is sort of a cache that can sit in front of that as well as sit in front of other backends also. Um, that was something internally developed and open sourced. Um, Kuber Healthy is another one, which is a health checking system for Kubernetes. Uh, and Vinyl DNS is one of our internal DNS management solutions. So these are all projects that we have built. And then there's, of course, contributions that we're making to Kubernetes and other solutions ourselves as well. Uh, so lastly, you know, where are we going from here, right? What's the future of open source and these business models? I don't have all the answers. I sought to sort of hopefully educate everybody today and myself selfishly as well through this process. Um, I think the, the, the flow of money into the open source space is driving a tremendous amount of change. Uh, and the demand from the market, the demand from t organizations like Comcast, right, to, um, to consume open source either directly and run it ourselves or via cloud providers, which we do a lot of ourselves as well. And that's forcing the models and the licenses that have worked over the last sort of 25 years um, you know, to change in the future. So you know, how, how, where is it gonna go? How do we predict that? I don't, I don't know that I have all the answers, but uh, hopefully you walk away with understanding a bit more about the space and, uh, and, and as certainly I did as well. Thanks. I saw you ah, first. A friendly. <laughs> <laughs> I, this was not play a question? It, no, it wasn't. <laughs> Be um, nice. <laughs> so from a monetization standpoint, sure. so as we go forward, how much do you see it, the, the trend, or at least uh, the model, where it's micro changes or necessarily paying individual contributors as opposed to company sponsorship in ways um, do you, an, almost like a gig economy kind of mm -hmm. thing, do you think that's gonna become more prevalent as we go forward, that there's more individual contributors who are on a, on a, on a pay to submit kind of basis? Yeah, I, th I think we've seen that, um, and, and I think solutions like Tidelift are probably a way to sort of like scale up that model a little bit. Um, we see this a lot with some of these open source projects that are kind of in the middle of the space, I think, where you have the, potentially the creators form a, um, you know, a little, a little consulting shop, right, around that open source project and are willing to do specific um, feature development for paying customers, right, well, they, where, where they can fundamentally alter the, the roadmap if they believe it, it's sort of the right place. Um, and I think that's an area where, where we can see some expanded expansion in the future, yeah. As you look at these platforms at, at Comcast, <clears throat> you know, and you're gonna use these for some pretty big scale mm -hmm. items and you start to put some chips on a platform, with the different licensing models of open source and their support and you know, add-on features, et cetera, how do you 
make a decision on your team if you're going to pay for that support or if you think you can support it yourself internally or use a partner? Like, mm. How do you figure out that cost side for yeah. Comcast? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, I think the financial model here, right, how to, how to support this is, uh, is a complex one. We, I think, generally use a fairly distributed decision-making model on the whole, uh, meaning it's up to most of the engineering teams largely to decide what's best for them and how to fund uh, and make the business case to pay for these things. Um, I think what we see is that a lot of our teams elect to contribute in some way to the support models uh, for some of these open source projects, either because they're looking for support in a material way and want to have a backstop for themselves, uh, or because they're looking for the, um, some additional enterprise features, and that might drive them down that path as well. But I myself have certainly run a number of open source pro products um, directly myself and supported them. I think on the whole that makes sense at some, some of the small to medium scales. As things become more critical to the enterprise, um, we often look, at least initially, to, to the vendors uh, in the space to help. But as we develop centers of excellence around these things, Cloud Foundry is a great example of that. We have a tremendous team um, and a huge community of engineers that derive a tremendous amount of benefit from that. Um, we can sort of bring some of that expertise and develop some of that expertise in-house, which enables us to you know, be a little bit more flexible with choosing whether or not to consume that. But I think we have probably both of those scenarios. Yeah. Hello. Just um, I saw your timeline. It was pretty extensive uh, mm. history of using open source. Mm. Can you share what successes or challenges you faced in maintaining executive uh, support throughout that time period? Because what we see is that you know you get a ball rolling, uh, maybe a leadership changes, um, and uh, projects are abandoned and yeah. support for them, uh, both externally and internally. So how, how did you maintain the support over that period of time? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Probably a, a, a longer answer, but I'll give you the sort of uh, my perspective as a consumer and contributor internally. We've got sort of this inner source model that we support, uh, and as well, we've contributed externally as well. I think, um, generally speaking, the leadership from day one has been supportive. Obviously, that, that ebbs and flows. Uh, and we're, so we're fortunate in that respect, I think. Um, and, and, and to the extent that we've put our money where our mouth is, mouths are, if you will, uh, and the creation of this open source practice office, um, that's really helped to create a, a sustainable, um, I guess, model, if you will, internally for, for the advo not only advocating for open source, but making it easy to have a well-paved road to both consume open source, but also contribute. I think historically where we saw a lot of challenge was it was, it was very unclear how to go about contributing, uh, and, and many people didn't spend too much time understanding how to consume. Uh, and as a result, though, in the last three or four years, I think we've seen a much, much more sustainable model um, or built around that because of this knowledge in the space. Yeah. It's actually all the time we have for questions, yeah. so I'm sure you Happy can. Happy to take uh, some afterwards. Yeah, grab Chris after. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.